Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome or welcome back to the Literary Translation Center. My name is Daniel Hahn. I'm going to be chairing this uh, thing which is called either a translation duel or a translation slam or one of a number of different possible things it can, call all, it can be called, uh, all of which suggest um, that you're going to witness a certain amount of violence, um, which I believe is not in fact going to happen. So if you've come here expecting to see blood on the carpet, uh, this is probably not going to happen, but then again, I always hope that maybe one day we will actually shed some blood during one of these events. It depends on whether Ollie and Sophie are uh, relatively well behaved or not, and we will find out very shortly. I will explain just very quickly what this event is and what the purpose of it is for those of you who haven't been to one before, um, because it's a slightly peculiar uh, it's a slightly peculiar event, which we've been doing for a few years. The, the reason behind the way we do these events is simply that those of us who work as translators, I think, increasingly found ourselves spending quite a lot of our time uh, on stage, on panels, at book fairs such as this, attempting to talk about translation uh, in a way that is uh, interesting and meaningful, and in fact finding that it's quite difficult to, be, to talk in an interesting and meaningful way about translation using only abstractions. And talking about things like voice and fidelity and cadence and tone, all these things are important to writers and translators, is actually quite hard to do when you're only talking in abstractions. So we came up with this format for talking about translation, which is really going to look at very detailed bits of text. But we're going to be, I suppose, looking at those same things, which are voice and fidelity and tone and cadence and so forth, um, but doing it by extrapolating a conversation out of some really detailed examination of bits of writing. So what we've done is we've asked two translators uh, to produce their own versions of short pieces of uh, Spanish text. Um, they are only now, I don't know if you've actually even turned your pages over yet. They are only at this point uh, seeing what each other has done. Um, I should say that in the 50 or so uh, sentences which are translated in this passage, there are two sentences that are the same in both translations and everything else is different. Um, in some cases quite considerably different. And the point of our conversation is not, uh, I should make this clear because it's only fair, we're not, I'm not going to let you choose a winner and we're not going to vote and they're not like a trapdoor thing, though again, one day I want to quite do that. Um, but the idea is to look at the ways in which, in fact, the fact that they're different is not about one being better or one being worse or one being right or wrong, or one being faithful or free. It's simply about the fact that Every translator is a reader, every translator is a writer. Every translator will notice and be interested in and prioritize different things when they read, and every translator will use languages differently. In this case, we have two brilliant translations of the same thing, and they are two translations which are brilliant using almost entirely different words. Um, we're going to be looking in very great detail, by which I mean um, there is a comma in the first, I think it's the first sentence, yeah, first or second sentence, there is a comma which we're going to talk about. It's going to take a really long time. We're not going to get through all of this. And I make no apologies for the fact that this is relentlessly slow, a remorselessly, relentlessly nerdy way of looking at it. But I think that these very, very small things, these differences which may actually be tiny differences, like putting a comma in, taking a comma out, are actually what make, they're what make voice, aren't they? Bits of writing are made up of lots of very tiny things. So we have with us, uh, we have a fantastic, in fact, I was going to say fantastic novelist, who in fact is our author of the day at the London Book Fair. Is that right? So. Our author of the day. Valeria is our author of the day. Valeria is Sally. Um, who gets a round of applause just for being author of the day. This is just, you just have to show up and you're ready. Welcome. Um, and we have two brilliant translators, uh, Sophie Hughes and Ollie Brock, um, who've translated each the very beginning of uh, Valeria's new novel. Um, I shouldn't have done this because it's mean, but I have done this nonetheless because I obviously am mean. Uh, we have the recently published translation. Um, this is translate, translated by Christina McSweeney. I said I wasn't going to point out, but there she is. Um, this is the, uh, I'm thinking of this as like the, the control and the experiment, um, which you're going to resist the temptation to look at. But we have two, or possibly if you count it, three, very different uh, and all very brilliant translations of the same short piece of short piece of text 
Um, I'm going to start, oh, well, I'll just tell you very quickly, I, I hope you have or have sight of uh, a copy of this handout. Very quickly, just so you know what you've got, you have Valeria's original on the first page. Uh, it moves on after that to Ollie's translation and then to Sophie's translation. Um, and if you go to what, in my version at least, is page six, this is where you'll find the two translations broken down sentence by sentence and put uh, alongside one another for ease of uh, comparing and contrasting. We will spend most of our time looking at those, those things which are alongside. We possibly won't get very far beyond the beginning of page six. Yeah. I'm going to start by asking Valeria to read just in Spanish, if you could read the, just the first two paragraphs, the first seven lines or so. Two paragraphs. Eight lines, two mm -hmm. paragraphs. Okay, hello. Thank you for being here next to the bathroom. Hmm. Um, okay. Soy el mejor cantador de subastas del mundo, pero nadie lo sabe porque soy un hombre comedido. Me llamo Gustavo Sánchez Sánchez y me dicen, yo creo que de cariño, carretera. Puedo imitar a Janis Joplin después de dos cubas. Sé interpretar galletas de la suerte. Puedo parar un huevo de gallina sobre una mesa, como hacía Cristóbal Colón. Sé contar hasta ocho en japonés, ichini, sanchi, kolo, kosichi, hachi. Sé nadar de muertito. Thank you very much. Um, Ollie, would you read your version of that bit? Okay, hello. I'm the best auction caller in the world, but nobody knows it because I'm a modest man. My name is Gustavo Sanchez Sanchez, and they call me, out of affection, I think, Road. I can imitate Janis Joplin after a couple of drinks. I can interpret fortune cookies. I can stand a hen's egg on a table like Christopher Columbus. <laughs> I can count to eight in Japanese. Ichi ni san shiko loko sichi hachi. I can tread water. Thank you, Sophie. Let's have yours. I'm the greatest auctioneer in the world, but nobody knows it because I'm an understorted sort of fellow. My name is Gustavo Sanchez Sanchez, but people call me, I think out of affection, highway. I do a decent Janis Joplin after a couple of Cuba Libres. I can decode fortune cookies. I can stand an egg upright on a table, just like Christopher Columbus did, and know my Japanese numbers to eight, ichi, ni, san, chi, ko, loko, sichi, yachi. I know how to float on my back. It's sort of hard to know where to start. Um, because everything about all of those sentences is different. Um, the structures of the sentence, apart, it's not just a matter of individual words, the structures of the sentences are different. The number of sentences you've ended up with is different as well, rather amazingly. Um, and I'm going to start by asking about that. And I think we have Ollie's first two sentences are Sophie's single sentence. Um, Sophie, you are the person who has, uh, who's, uh, been the, the delinquent in this particular instance um, and taken two of Valeria's sentences and merged them into, into something. Yes, and it happens, it happens again. Um, can you say something about how you, I was going to say how you justify, or defend yourself. No, how you explain making that kind of decision? Because this isn't simply a matter of am I going to say greatest or am I going to say best, which is one distinction. It's actually a matter of the shape of the sentences and, and the, the pace of it. I started with best. Um, because mejor just comes out as best. I think when I translate in my head, when I speak in Spanish, mejor is best. But when you're describing yourself as the best, you usually, I think it comes out as he's the greatest. I don't know, I've kind of got like an Olympian theme song in, in the back <laughs> of my head, but it's, he's the greatest at something rather than the best, I don't know. Um, the comma, I just remember at school being told never to start a sentence with but. <laughs> <laughs> Ollie, Ollie, did no one ever teach you this? Ollie. No, it's just disgraceful. Has no one ever told you not to never had it. <laughs> uh, I remember that, and also just because uh, when I read it out loud, it just flowed as one sentence, really so I just shoved a comma in there, really. Was there a point, I, mean, I don't know if you remember this, was there you know, a, a first draft in which this was two sentences in the way it was in the original, and you try it and then you merge them? Or does that come straight out the first time for you? 
Uh, no, the, the first thing you said. I usually try to stick to the original sentence structure and then I read out loud and I change it. If and I then think. you start playing fast and loose with Valeria's punctuation. Yeah. And then my school teacher comes into my head <laughs> and I think I can't do this. Well, Ollie, disgracefully, you have started a sentence with a conjunction, but obviously it's completely unacceptable. It's wow. amazing we allow you to be here. Um, and I, and I, didn't, I didn't do my research, but I've just asked Valeria, and she said they also teach you at school in Mexico not to start a sentence with pedo. Oh, but she's go. done it. Yeah. <laughs> and if she's allowed to do it, you're allowed to do it. <laughs> well, and even to reflect her text as best I can, maybe it is the best thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> what, about, what about best and greatest? So if you said that yeah. the, 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 the kind of instinct she had is that one would say, I'm the greatest. Yeah. Um, is, is, that, is that, you use the word best, is that something you kind of stopped and thought about and weighed various options, or is that just the word that was there? It was the word that was there, and I'm not sure I thought of alternatives. I'm not, not sure I thought about it, I'm afraid. Um, and then when I saw... It's not too late now. Think about it now. <laughs> I'm thinking about it. And, uh, well, when I saw... Um, uh, well, a frequent tactic of mine in these things, the way I burst my opponent's bubble is by admitting straight away that their version's better than mine, which is <laughs> what which I was... Which is what I was just about to do. <laughs> That's too polite. That's too polite. <laughs> which is what I was doing at first. I thought, oh, greatest. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, that's much better. It's so, so I'm not sure. I'm not... I think it's a matter of preference, actually. But um, my only kind of note on that is I think the idiomatic use of greatest um, tends to sit on its own like I am the greatest, mm. but um, if you're saying what you are, the, the phrase that comes to mind most is, like, I'm the best X in the world, mm. if you see what I mean, if it's going to be followed by in the world. But like I say, I mean, much of a muchness to me, actually. And, and that X, are you the best auction caller or are you the best auctioneer? Yeah, I looked that up uh, online. Google, Google Translate, by the way, offered, I, I'm the best singer of auctions. Yeah, it's all I think it's quite singers. nice. Well, I think yeah. we don't sing enough <laughs> auctions. Auctioneer again. I, th I just didn't think of the word. I mean, is, I mean, uh, uh, is it always cantador? Subastador, también. Okay. Sí, no, it, it's either or. Is there is there a difference, Valeria, between? I mean, if you'd use subastador instead of cantador. No, of there's there's a difference in texture, but not in in, in meaning. And I think the the major difference is. Um, and I, and I think a lot about these things when I write, uh, a, amount of syllables in a sentence and sentence length. And I tend to look for sentences in Spanish that are uh, shorter rather than longer. And I, I, was just, I was just noticing that, that that's in some cases reflected here and in, in others is not. No? Will, you read, will you read the first sentence again in Spanish? In Spanish, just this first sentence. Just the first sentence. Soy el mejor cantador de subastas del mundo. Uh, Ollie, would you read your first sentence again? I'm the best auction caller in the world. And Sophie, as far as, your, as far as that comma? I'm the greatest auctioneer in the world, but nobody knows it. <laughs> to which comma? <laughs> yes, pick, pick a comma. <laughs> I'm the greatest auctioneer in the world. Thank you. Nobody knows it because I'm a modest man or I'm an understated sort of fellow. There's, a, there's an enormous difference in, uh, in the tone of those last mm. words. A modest man and an understated sort of fellow seem to me quite different. I mean, it's saying kind of the same thing, but it's, it's an entirely different entirely voice different. speaking, isn't entirely it? Entirely different, yeah. How do they sound to you? Well, I really like them both. That's, and I'm reading both. Oh, thank God for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always going to say that in this. <laughs> um, She'll tell us privately afterwards. <laughs> no, I, I kind of, I kind of liked understated sort of fellow because I thought it was, I think what I was looking for, in highways voice, carreteras voice, was a kind of popular knowledge, kind of like how a, an aunt would speak to you, um, but a nun that would never use a cliché. She, she would always use a form that comes, comes out as, as infused with kind of popular, popular mm. wisdom, but n never, never a made phrase. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's kind of genuine rather than formulated. Or exactly. Anything. So never, ever, ever formulated. Mm. Um, I mean, sometimes that's impossible in some sentences. But el comedimiento in Spanish is not... It's kind of out of use. It's kind of um, 
it's something that grandparents might say or, or, or in certain situations you might say, but it's not, it's not a word that circulates um, very, very often in people's mouths. So I, I, I would go for something in English, I mean, I wouldn't translate this to English, but that, that, that did that, 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 that used a word that was kind of out of use. There is also some difference in meaning between modest and understated, which is ju just in terms of actually what the words mean, quite apart from register and number of syllables and things. Um, again, I suppose I want to ask both of you whether you, how deliberate your choice of this word was and whether you thought about other options or whether it kind of felt like you just knew that what that was trying to convey was modesty or what she was trying to convey was understatement. Um. Well, um, again, when I saw Safe's version, I thought, oh, that's way better. Um, and again, I'm just going to add something for my side, which is um, I'm not sure I've ever heard somebody describe themselves as understated. I think you only really hear it as a remark about someone else. And generally, it's a sort of, well, understated sort of compliment. You know, it's, it, t it tends to be complimentary. Um, but ridiculously enough, you do hear people describe themselves as modest. I'm yes. sure I've done it too. You know, you, <laughs> no, sometimes I'm much someone, more modest than you are. So, <laughs> precisely. So, um, I'm a I'm a modest. I mean, people. I mean, it, presumably the joke is partly in the fact that people do actually say stuff. You do actually say, well, uh, you wouldn't have found out about it. I tell you, I'm quite modest about these things or whatever. Yes. You know. So, hashtag did, humble brag. Exactly. Yeah. So that that sounds a little. So even though, I think. Sophie's translated it, if you like, much more than I have, and it sounds much better. It's, it's more idiomatic, as well as very, very English. Um, there's a little rub in there for me. Is there, Valeria, just before I come to Sophie, is this person... I've just got the book, I haven't read the book. Uh, is this person modest? Or is this person the kind of person who says they are modest? He believes he's modest. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. He's not, he's not a modest man. But right. it's, it's, but that, it's, but that's quite it's more complex yeah. than that. So, okay. so modest... I'm asking you to sum up your main character in one word. It's very <laughs> easy to do, obviously. Comedido yeah. is good. Thank he's you. He's comedido. Yeah. Sorry, Sophie. I thought modest first just because it's what you say. I, I have exactly the same feeling as Ollie, but I went against it because otherwise I would have thought that Valeria would have written modest. I would have, I would have imagined the word. And comedido just seemed to me quite an unusual word, so I thought... Actually, this is quite a self-conscious thing that he's doing, talking about himself, laying himself out. I'm this, I'm that, I'm good at this, I'm good at doing that. And I thought that it was almost his defense before he started. So I'm an, understand I'm an understated sort of fellow, but I can do this, I know how to do that, I, I'm very good at this. Mm. So I, I kind of felt that there was something that... It was a very self-conscious thing he was saying, so understated felt fitting precisely because Comedido felt like something that wouldn't naturally come out. It's like he's almost been thinking about he's what he wanted to say word, before right? he begins to yeah. say it. Sophie, can I ask you, this is a completely unfair thing to ask you to do, but here we are. Um, and I have a microphone so I can say anything I like. Can I ask you to read that first sentence twice? Once as it is, and once without the second comma there. Hmm. The second comma is something you didn't need, but you have. But Ollie have. has the equivalent without that comma. You so if you can see how it sounds as you've done it, and then slightly less punctuated. So this one is as I've done it, with two commas. I'm the greatest auctioneer in the world, but nobody knows it, because I'm an understated sort of fellow. Okay. I'm the greatest auctioneer in the world, but nobody knows it because I'm an understated sort of fellow. The second one is closer to what Ollie has, that you have one break, the second version, they have one break and then everything runs on. Um, something like that, uh, in the Spanish, there is no, as it were, second comma. We have a second comma. Does reading things aloud as you just did, just sounding things out, play a part in how you decide where you're going to put that mm. breath? Because that, that comma isn't necessary for meaning. It's not necessary for shape. It's not necessary for anything other than you obviously think that when you read it aloud, there's a breath there in a way that Holly didn't. Mm. Is that part of the, 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 the kind of refining process? I think it's part of our process when we write in English, when we're not translating, I hope. I don't think there's a rule with comma that anyone could absolutely <laughs> define for me in one sentence. So I'm useless at grammar, really. I shouldn't admit that as a translator, <laughs> but I am. Uh, 
So I just see how it sounds and I add them in. Ollie, but nobody noted, comma, because I'm a modest man. Well, I think I, think I just took... I mean, in, in the original, it just runs on and it's quite kind of... There's this quite um, sort of frank, straightforward staccato style. And I'm afraid I, c I can't remember whether or not I thought about whether to put a comma in there. I mean, it might not have occurred to me because there isn't one in the mm. original, but I mean, a bit, a bit as you're suggesting, in English, it's just optional. So would I have put one up? Yeah, it, dep it depends, actually. It depends how kind of how... Uh, how sort of cascading you want your, how sort of full of pauses you want your yeah. prose to be. I think that, you know, you mentioned rules, Sophie, but um, I, I likewise don't know whether, what the rule would dictate in this case, but I think this, with this kind of thing, you're way in the territory of um, style, you know, the writer's kind of art, whether or not you do that, you know, as for instance, and starting a sentence and, and you, with And you bar. get to the point where you have some control of a voice in the same way the writer does. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, I think because we're slightly over 20 minutes in, we should move on to line two. <laughs> I hope everyone's very comfortable. We're not leaving until we've... Actually, we might just do the whole novel while we're here. Um, it's quite a short novel. Um, would you, Valeria, will you read Me llamo Gustavo Sanchez Sanchez? Just that sentence, please. The second sentence. Second, uh, third oh, sentence the third of yours. Sentence. Second sentence in Sophie's because she's a delinquent and put punctuation <laughs> in. Your third sentence, please. Me llamo Gustavo Sánchez Sánchez y me dicen, yo creo que de cariño, carretera. Thanks. Uh, Sophie, please. My name is Gustavo Sánchez Sánchez, but people call me, I think out of affection, highway. Holly. My name is Gustavo Sánchez Sánchez and they call me, out of affection, I think, road. We have a comma, we have an and and a but, we have the out of affection which is back to front, we have all sorts of dashes that weren't in the original and we have the name of the main character. Hmm. Um, otherwise, everything is pretty much the same in this <laughs> sentence as far as I can tell. Uh, I really like how the change of that comma inside the clause, inside the, um, the dashes, creates a, comp a staccato that's kind of more similar to the version in Spanish that pause out of affection, I think, instead yeah. of, I think out of affection, which kind of rolls more naturally. Yeah. But that, that hesitance uh, bre breaks the sentence a little bit as, as I was trying to break it myself. Is it, is it a fair observation to say that one of the things that happens be from having either out of affection, I think, or I think out of affection, is one of them leads very well to a monosyllabic name at the end and one leads very well to a two-syllable name at the end. That's that actually, out of affection, I think, wrote, wrote that, the, that, that the shape of that lends itself to sitting on that one syllable mm -hmm. at the end. It makes total Whereas, sense. Uh, call me, I think, out of affection, highway. And it's not, it's not I mean, that, that may be complete nonsense, and I'm not entirely sure what I'm saying, but it does seem to me that I believe the, the you, decision, I, thank I, you. I hear you. The author says I'm right. You see, <laughs> she knows stuff. What I suppose what I'm getting at is, the decision about what to, whether you meant this or not, the decision about what to call this character, what to make this nickname, isn't just about meaning. And it may be partly about what happens when you get to the end of this particular formulation of words. Although it's a, I mean, you know, this is the only mention in this passage, but it's a book length decision, isn't it? I mean, it's the, yeah. it's the guy's name. So. Yeah. <laughs> You've got to get that right. I think I'm before now stuck, else. stuck with this name. I made this terrible decision about but inverting something between dashes in the third sentence. I'm I do stuck think with actually, this wretched name now. I'm, I'm pleased. I'm pleased with the general concession to my um, my questionable version. But I do think <laughs> that um, uh, each of our rhythms is um, self-sufficient. If you see what I mean, I think each of us has has written a, a good rhythmical sentence. If you see what I mean. I agree with that. But but you know the road, highway thing, I mean, that's... Yeah. So why did you good, choose... Good to there isolate are later, though. Yeah. Um, I thought it's a general word. Uh -huh. Like, it could be... So I haven't read the novel. So, the, it, I don't know, it could be, sh you know, short, could be long, could be... Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a variable size, isn't it? Yeah. I think I was vaguely thinking of Cormac McCarthy as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And why... Because one, one of the... Um, the questions that uh, Christina McSweeney and I had when, we when she was translating this 
to English was, um, should carretera be translated at all? No? But proper names should not be translated. Um, mm. They were translated in, in Mexico in, in the early 20th century. No? So we used to read in Porrua the works of Guillermo Shakespeare and the works of Federico Nietzsche. Mm. They, 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 were, yeah. they were domesticized, yeah. so to speak. Um, but I, I mean, I as a translator, which I am not, <laughs> would not <laughs> translate a proper name. Mm. However, I thought with this book that the, the, the name had to be translated. Yeah, it's a nickname that has, that has a it's, meaning, it, which yeah, is... So, was that your same... Like, wh why did you not just leave it, Carretera? Well, given this... Straight, more or less straightforwardness of the meaning of the word and given it's a nickname rather than... Which I'm not sure I'd class as a proper name quite. I don't it's think it occurred to me not to translate it, actually. Mm, okay. It didn't occur to me not to translate it. It's mm. interesting. Yeah. Is, is, is there something... Well, pre presumably there's something that these, this guy's friends want to suggest by calling him Carretera, yeah. right, which you... The, want the, to the, carry mean, over. the meaning must be must be relevant to why he has the name. I'd also say it's not within the kind of ten immediately recognisable Spanish words. You know, it's not like yeah. um, manana. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. We had um, for a while we uh, we had turnpike as well as a possible name, <laughs> nice. and uh, I I really I really like turnpike That's too. Right. And um, it was my, my American publishers who said, no, that's, that's too New Jersey. Yeah. And <laughs> I, that I was, apparently yeah. the, the union, and, and not union enough what? Not, not and New not York enough. enough. No, they're yeah. not, no, 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 no. They're from Minnesota. So they're like, that's to, yeah. so East Coast and yeah. specifically so New Jersey. I was so going to ask about highway though, because highway to me sounds like an American word. Yeah, there is, but, hi, but highway, uh, it, it makes sense. Read the novel. <laughs> no, Highway, I mean, he, he's, um, he's a lover of uh, Willie Nelson, uh, who had a band called the Highwaymen, and he, he impersonates Willie Nelson singing Highwaymen, uh -huh. so that there, there is um, a reason for it to be Highway and not Turnpike. Did you know this, this, did you have this secret information from actually knowing the book? Because I know Valeria a bit. I know that her daughter likes to sing Highwayman. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess. Yes. She's seen my daughter standing up on our kitchen table many times, singing and dancing Highwayman. <laughs> it wasn't going to be dual carriageway. No. <laughs> um, those, those dashes in that sentence, just when you thought I was going to leave that sentence, I'm not. You've both, you have both um, changed the punctuation. You both changed the punctuation in the same way. Um, surely you could have done in English exactly the same thing as in Spanish. You can put it between commas. Not really. Well, you possibly couldn't because you've broken up, I think. But what Sophie's done, I think, out of affection, because it's not... Oh, yeah. That was my issue, really, with the I think and the comma that Ollie put in. I really love... I probably... I actually do prefer this version of Ollie. But I... I don't know. It was more than a comma. I think that pause that I read earlier with the with the comma after yeah. the it in the first one. This is more. This is mm. a side thought. Mm. This is, I think, out of affection. Out of affection. It's also a side thought which is expressed as someone speaking. It sounds. This is when it sounds like a voice. Voice. They call me. I think out of out of affection. It actually sounds like a spoken voice very strongly at this at that moment, doesn't sure. it? Yeah. I think that they, they're both um, underlining his nuance more than the Spanish maybe needs to underline the nuance. So it's not the same thing to say, me llamo Gustavo Sánchez Sánchez y me dicen de cariño, carretera, which is a very normal uh -huh. thing to say in Spanish. They call me out of affection. Yeah. But he, the, his, his hesitation nuances and makes the reader, I think, um, question whether really it is out of affection or not. Yeah. That so in fact, there's, there's slightly, what's happening in, in both versions is a slightly enhanced version of something which is in the, in exactly. there anyway, in the character exactly. anyway. Which is perhaps a very um, n normal feeling when you're translating, which is you, you have to really underline the things that are maybe subtle so that the reader in translation won't lose, won't, won't lose those, won't, won't miss them. I think so. We're just looking at the other version. Do you want to read the other version? 
No, no dashes in the other version. I'm not going to say anything else. Um, Janis Joplin. Let's have a sentence about Janis Joplin. Valeria, please. Puedo imitar a Janis Joplin después de dos cubas. I do a decent Janis Joplin after a couple of Cuba Libras. Cuba Libres. Oli. Uh, I can imitate Janis Joplin after a couple of drinks. That, that's for me one of the most interesting differences yeah. in the whole translation. Um, let's talk about those couple of drinks first. <laughs> um, in the Spanish, we have something which is suggesting a particular drink, but is also almost generic because it's down into a single word and it's very casual and very quick. And a couple of drinks, it's kind of taking it one way and a couple of Cuba Libre is, is sort of taking it the other way. Is that fair? Uh, yes, I think that's fair, yeah. Good, good, <laughs> I'm glad. Right, I'm, I'm <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was thinking. That's interesting. So, Tell me more about yeah, that. Uh, right, fine, fine. <laughs> I will. Um, just didn't think of the Cuba Libre thing. Didn't think of it. Um, but looked up Cuba and, uh, and tried to find it in a couple of um, Mexican online slang dictionaries and thought, I bet this is a straightforward slang word for like a small drink. Or jar, jar. That would yeah. have been it. Something like a couple, that. A couple of jars, Damn. Yeah. As far as I know, no, Oli. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, um, I don't know. I, th I think Cuba is Cuba. Leave it. Yeah. Okay, fine, fine, fine. And I saw it meant bucket or tub or something, so I yeah. thought, oh, <laughs> uh, you know. Or cubet, sounds, like cubeta. Right. Yeah, like cubeta. Right, yeah. yeah. I thought maybe if it's in, like, it's like un par de cañas, if it was in Spain or... Mm. Yeah. I thought even right, thought of writing a couple of pints. That sounded like too much yeah. drink more than was being suggested. Although now I'm not sure. But presumably, the, Valeria, the point isn't what the drinks are, isn't what it's about. Presumably. It's like, I can do a decent dance, Janice Joplin. I can't do it after a couple of Manhattans. I can only do it <laughs> after a Long Island iced tea sometimes. <laughs> Cuba Libres, I'd take two. You know. the, 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 so there is a point, in which, a sense in which it is sort of casual, but it is nonetheless referring to a specific It specific is drink. referring to a specific, a specific drink, but it is casual. I, I think, had I, had I written a cocktail, then yeah. yes, then you, then, then you risk, it's almost a, like a proper name. But, but, but Cuba maybe is, is as generic, I mean, it, it refers to one specific thing, yeah. but it's, it's as, it, it circulates as much as does a beer, for example. Like, so like it a doesn't couple of really matter. You don't, yeah, Sophie. But what's, it's what ordinary, I think, in other words. It is very ordinary. Yeah. But what I find interesting is that you kind of sit, situate, I mean, this was another discussion that Christina and I had, was should, should we bring in so many foreign words to the beginning of the novel. What, what happens when you bring in foreign sounding words, even though Cuba Libre is almost a trademark, but what, what happens when you bring that in so early on in a book? Does that alienate? Does that bring closer? And I think what you've done is kind of um, brought the text closer to the reader in a way, mm. by, by, by erasing a cultural trace and just, just using the word, the generic drink. Mm. Sophie. In my mind, a drink sort of maketh the man or the woman. <laughs> what you drink tells you something about the person. So I wouldn't have gone for drink just because I think it's different if a man drinks a pint and if he drinks a, a couple of rums and Coca-Cola. That's true. Completely. So for me, it had to be Cuba Libre. Yeah. Cuba doesn't mean anything in English, but Cuba Libre does. You know, the couple English reader is going to read Cuba it's Libre. It's a good point. It's I, think, point. I think it's also in, exactly in the nature of these sort of esoteric, slightly irritating boasts to name the drink. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. As though yeah. it's a magic formula, it really works after two Cuba Libres, but not yeah. whatever not else. Do you know what I mean? And I can, and I can, I can have two, I can drink two Cuba Libres. Yes. <laughs> and, <so>, yeah, <laughs> and, and do a decent Janice Joplin. Um, that's not me, I'm reading now. Um, I do a decent Janice Joplin, or I can imitate Janice Joplin. Is there, apart from voice, is there any difference in meaning? I mean, are, are we talking about the same amount of skill, if you like, the same kind of skill? Or is it just a, is it, or just a voice question about how you phrase it? Mm. Puedo imitar a Janis Joplin? Is I can, I can imitate Janis Joplin, it's as simple as... I really like the I do -er. I would never tell someone that I can imitate someone. You'd say, I, I do a good Madonna, or I, I do. Yeah. Uh, 
do you? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Sophie, now we're going to have a brief interlude. <laughs> Uh, but it, it didn't work. Like, rhythmically, it's horrible. I do a Janis Joplin. Actually, doesn't mean... You don't say that in English. Mm. It, it's completely idioma, uh, idiomatic. Sounds and, like, I do Janis Joplin. Well, exactly. It does. <laughs> yes, <it's> just, <laughs> no. I used to, obviously. Used now, to do now it would be weird. And so then I had to put in a word. Uh, and I didn't want to change the meaning. But doing something decently is being able to do it, I would say. Yeah. So, and then it came out beautifully because I do a decent, I think, rolls off the tongue and it's, I do a decent Janis Joplin. There's those nice double Ds, double Js. It just mm, I agree. It worked. And you can also decode fortune cookies. <laughs> as opposed to interpreting fortune cookies. Again, is there a, is there a difference in those things? Ollie's is better. <laughs> Ollie, yours is better. <laughs> Quite. Now, uh, I, didn't, I didn't think of decode. I'm not sure that's quite what you do with them. I think you just, well, you tell a, well, you tell a fortune or you interpret a fortune cookie, I think. No, but not fortune cookies. They're all, they, you can never understand fortune cookies, no? They always have very, um, very obscure messages. So there is a... Um, there is a kind of deciphering. Mm. I don't know what word I used. What did I do? Interpret. Oh, interpret. Yeah, interpret. Yeah. 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 And, and it, you know, inter to interpret something for someone is a bit different to understand fully, as in see your future. It simply means take a message and rephrase for somebody or interpret. A bit like reading a palm. I mean, you could have, could have almost said a read fortune cookies, although because it is actually a bit of text, it doesn't quite work, but it's something like exactly. that. No, I was going to put read, and then I thought it didn't quite come across enough. Interpret seems to me, I don't know, it just felt like something someone wouldn't say. So I changed it, and I didn't come up, I didn't get that kind of aha moment. That's the word, but this is what I came up with. Um, I'm going to jump forward two sentences. Can we do the bit about writing his notes? Uh, in just a moment, we can certainly do that. I want to ask you about your Japanese numbers. Um, and my only question about your Japanese numbers is a really annoying question, which is about whether you italicize your Japanese numbers or not. <laughs> <laughs> You'll just have to bear with us. I've just got a little chat here. You've got to bear with us for a second, but I think that's quite interesting. Um, on what basis do you make that decision? That's, that's I, I would say in practice you probably won't. The publisher and editors will more or less decide, in my experience. Yeah. Do whichever because they are the ones who will decide. With something like italicizing, I don't take more than a half a second to think about whether I'm going to bother do it to, to do it or not because there'll be a house style. Right. Yeah. No, we haven't. We also, have no she italics. could have italicized them in the original, presumably. I don't think so. I, I tend not to italicize foreign words, yeah. but I don't remember if, if how style in, Span in Sexto Piso italicizes or not. Mm. I really but, just but don't there, remember. But, but there are foreign words and there are foreign words. And in this case, he's yeah. saying he's, he's, it's about them being foreign words. So it's not using a word saying, I'm going to have a couple of Kuwaliwis and then sing some Janis Joplin, in which yeah. you're using Kuwaliwis as though they were part of the same language in which you're speaking. Exactly. There's something different from that. That's different from saying, there are these Japanese words I know. Here are them looking as Japanese as I can possibly make them by making them look foreign. Somehow there is a difference between that kind of foreign word where you're drawing attention to the, foreignness. the, the, the foreignness of the yeah. word. Um, just very quickly before we move on to um, the thing Ollie was asking about. Um, I can tread water and I know how to float on my back. Those are not the same thing. No. Treading water, as I understand it, is staying in the same place, swimming in the same, swimming without going anywhere, yes? Uh, floating on my back is not the same thing. Is one of these, I hesitate to use the word wrong, but is one of these just wrong? Um, <laughs> <laughs> or, or are they just both ways of, of, of interpreting something which is slightly imprecise? So, can I say what Nadar de Muratito means? Okay. It means two things. 
Ah. So nadar de muertito is literal and also metaphorical. So the literal, the literal meaning is that you can float on your back. Mm-hmm. Um, like when L- you're like learning, like a dead person, like a dead person. Well, yeah, when you're, I mean literally, a like a corpse, a, a, a small dead person. Then what? Swim, so. swim of a small dead person. <laughs> That's a horrible image, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> well, you wrote it. I'm sorry. It's your, this is your book, Valerie. It's not I wasn't my fault. thinking of a little <laughs> dead person <laughs> floating, but okay. Um, and then there's a, I guess, a more met- metaphorical meaning, which is um, like someone that can can get away with things. Huh. Or maybe I just made that up. Hmm. My, the second meaning Did for me, and I'm, the, I read it in a headline in Mexico recently. It was Peña Nieto, the president of Mexico, who had said something like, we mustn't oh, yeah. nadar al muertito, muertito in this moment. And I took it to mean sit on one's hands, mm. as in sit on one's hands and let life wash over you. So in the end, I kind of went through sitting on one's hands and then you lose the swimming. Yeah. And to, to, to be able to lie on one's back, to float on one's back, is to let life wash over you, which is to not which do is anything to sit in about your hands. anything. But, yeah. but also yeah. treading water. Really come across, but, but also treading water is something you might use uh, figuratively, meaning yeah. not making any progress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just just treading water. Yeah. Mm. yeah, that's why I chose it. So, I suppose if in ordinary circumstances I would have been able to write to the author to say, um, "Do you intend this second meaning? What are you saying with this, etc." Um, but in this case, because not allowed to. Um, uh, I thought, oh, and because it's you know not for publication, so you can afford not to be too too safe. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have the baying hordes, obviously here, but otherwise, right. otherwise you're fine. <laughs> um, I thought, uh, well, but you try and find something to render the double meaning, and maybe that'll make it more interesting because you know you can tell when you come across something like this that another translator will almost definitely come up with something else. You know, I'm sure a third version might have produced a third, a third um, solution. And I thought, tread water, is this a... Well, play dumb is the translation that I came across of the idiomatic meaning. I also read that newspaper article. We must have Googled the phrase. <laughs> I'm exactly the I certainly time. did. Unless you happen to be reading Mexican newspaper on that day, which is more impressive. Uh, I didn't. Um, I Googled it. Play dumb. Play dumb, yeah. Yeah, so it means play dumb, like pretend you don't... It's not the same, actually, as treading water, but I thought if you're treading water in your life... Well, actually, you could be playing... You could be treading water... Uh, meanwhile, there's something you clearly ought to be doing. Mm. Yeah. And you're playing dumb as though you don't know or whatever. Yeah. I was just thinking it very literally in this passage. He's, he's listing things that he can do. Like yeah. Mm. Really, like, think he can stand, stand an egg upright. He can count to eight in Japanese. He can... He's very modest. <laughs> he's very mo- I'm very modest and the other things I can... Here are the other things I can do. Of course. As well as being modest. <laughs> Ali, there was something in particular you said you wanted to, to look at? Just the last paragraph. Just, I was just hoping that that was where you were going to skip to. Let's skip to the last paragraph. <laughs> there you go. Sorry. I mean the last section. Ah. Yeah. From page nine? Um, no, the last paragraph. Oh. <laughs> Give us a moment. Oh, I don't know. I mean, you, it was just a suggestion. Though. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the bit at the beginning of page nine in the English, and in Spanish, empezaba... Con la del Menique. Um, oh, yeah. Valeria, would you read us uh, the first three or four sentences? From Empezaba con la del Menique? Sí. Okay. Yes, please. Empezaba con la del Menique. Prensaba una esquina entre el diente incisivo central superior y el inferior. Desprendía apenas una, est- una astilla y de un solo jalón tiraba la media luna de uña colgante que le sobraba. Okay, let's hear, let's hear those bits. Uh, Ollie. Should I carry on? Uh, he would start with the little finger. He would trap a corner of the nail between his upper central incisor and the lower, split off the tiniest splinter, and in one tug he would pull off the crescent of nail that had grown out. Was that Thanks. It? Yeah, yeah, Sophie. Starting with the little fingernail. He would press one corner between his maxillary and mandibular central incisors, isolate a shred, and then pull the dangling half moon in a single swift move. Yes. <laughs> did, did you? 
did you have to Google teeth at some point? I learned yes. a lot about them. <laughs> yes. Sophie, did you know what the maxillary and mandibular central incisors were before you wrote that sentence? No, but I recognised them when I saw a photo. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You've seen them, I've got those. And why, why did you use that clinical language? Because it's a book about teeth, and he's obsessed with teeth. And I felt that Highway was quite a pedantic man in my brain, and he's an auctioneer, and he is eloquent and... Uh, probably has a kind of extensive vocabulary and in a funny way he's defending this strange treatise that he's writing on teeth mm. so it's his way of uh, showing that he knows what he's doing in a way as, mm. as I, I heard him I always hear him as quite a pedantic man so I thought he was going to show off what he knew the, because he's not very understated the novel for those of you who don't know I should have said is called The Story of My Teeth and one thing that if he knows anything about anything and there's the bit about hyperbolics, parabolics earlier. You know, yeah. he's a man who was actually the point of that phrase of him being understated is that he's not really. He's wanting to be w liked and wanting to be impressive. And of course, so. I suppose there are Spanish equivalent terms that he could have used. Maxiliar, mandibular. I had I never come across <laughs> those words in Spanish. They probably exist. <laughs> but I, I think, in, I mean, I've been to the dentist many times, so, so I, know, I know some words. With a, with a notebook. <laughs> you can always tell the novelist because they're going, ah, maxilar. Oh, <laughs> maxilar izquierda. You know, I'll, I'll have that. Yeah. Um, we haven't got that long left. I think I should allow some time for you to uh, ask questions, make comments, observations. Um, we haven't, we haven't quite finished, as you will notice. There was a little bit in the middle. Can I ask them one question yeah, first, yeah, very quick? One of, them, one of them, okay, so there's a sentence in English that says, having torn the nail clean off, he took a moment to savor his amuse-bouche, <laughs> then, roll, then roll his tongue into a tube. I don't know what amuse-bouche is, and I really want to <laughs> understand that image. And then the other one um, says, I've got, I don't have it, do you have it? After, the same sentence you mean. Yeah. yeah. After ripping it off, he would keep it in his mouth a few seconds, making something like a snooker cue <laughs> with his tongue. And I don't know what that is either. <laughs> so. It is nothing like an amuse bouche. <laughs> what I'm thinking, I don't know what amuse bouche or snooker cue. I haven't quite decided which <laughs> word to use here. Okay, explain yourselves, people. Yes, uh, I haven't please, got a question. Please explain yourself. Tell her, tell her what you're doing. Uh, tu tube is Sophie's equivalent to snooker cue. Tube, yeah. Yes. Behave. He would keep it in his mouth for a few seconds, basically, is one thing, is what you have. And he'd take a moment to savour his amuse bouche. Where's the original? Shall I, shall I yeah, go? go. Yeah. Um, in Spanish, he's entertaining it. It's... Entretener, so it's... La entretenía it's, unos instantes en la boca, hacía un taquito con la lengua y soplaba. A man That's biting it. his nails, his daughter's watching him, she's disgusted by him. And Amuse bouche came to me because we don't talk about... he. We, we, I could have said he played with it in his mouth. Or toyed, I've just thought. Or toyed with it. Mm. That would have been nice as well, actually. And then Amuse bouche came, and again, it's one of those things where because it's not being published, and uh, you can sort of feel a bit playful. And then I thought... This is a funny text. If it's not funny in English, it fails, actually. Mm. And uh, to, to toy with it in my mouth just didn't feel particularly funny. And because in Valeria, she, has the, she rolls the tongue into a taquito, a little taco. And I didn't want to use that metaphor at all, precisely would that, for the Would reason. that sound really strange in English, like to roll my tongue into a taco? Only because I think yeah. it wouldn't. I mean, we all eat Mexican food now because we, you know. But I, at the same time, it just, like, in the same way, reason that you didn't want to have Cuba Libre in yeah. the beginning. I just thought, actually, this you don't want the metaphor to strike too much. A, a metaphor should strike at something that you understand already in, in, implicitly, to my mind. Mm -hmm. And so if it's something that's going to just slightly jolt the reader too far out of what they're expecting to read. So the little tube, and then I thought, well, I'll play with the other side of the sentence. Then. So what is a mousse bouche? Ah, it's for the French for it's like a, a canapé, isn't it? So it's something a that was a little, a little, taster, of a little taster of something that you try to to to, 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 okay. to wake yeah. up your mouth, okay. which which you italicise apparently. <laughs> yeah. That's all I'm saying. Sorry, Ollie. Well, um, 
this Nuka Q thing was a, was, a, was a workaround, to say the least. But I looked up Taquito, and I haven't written down the things I found, but I couldn't find anything that quite, quite made sense. So I was hoping it would mean pea shooter. Does it mean pea shooter? <laughs> yeah. Really? Oh, it does. Oh, damn. Oh, what means pea shooter? No, no. Taquito. It, it, it means... It means no, taquito the means... Shape, the shape of a taco. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> the shape of a small taco. <laughs> damn, and I found taco... Yeah, damn. So anyway, I did spend a minute at my desk, like, manipulating my tongue, and I thought, <laughs> it, because it says entretenía en la boca, I thought it might meant hold it, as in between his lips, and then propel it out using the tongue. <laughs> that's exactly a what it is. Snooker cue. <laughs> but what is a snooker cue? <laughs> oh, right. A cue, so, oh, like, so a, yeah. like in snooker? Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so, so it's something which uses the tongue to push it out. Like the <laughs> that's brilliant, that's brilliant. Um, on which note, uh, <laughs> questions, comments? Uh, uh, yes, gentleman at the back. You wait for the microphone. Uh, I'm speaking as a professional linguist and translator, but I know no Spanish. Okay. Uh, in other, so I'm neutral, or if you like, ignorance is a bliss. Uh -huh. I'm simply looking at it as a reader and comparing the two translations. Uh, the first one of my name is Gustavo Sanchez, Sanchez but people call me I think out of affection, highway. The second one, Sophie's, is ambiguous between parentheses because I think out of affection is a complete sentence. I is the subject, think is the verb, and out of affection is the adverbial phrase, as it were. How do you think? Well, I think out of context, or I think <laughs> loudly. Somebody reading that can interpret it, understand it that way. So ambiguous, and you're relying on the reader to decode that ambiguity. You shouldn't leave it like that. So I uh, advocate Ollie's. He put a comma. <laughs> Punctuation <laughs> is not. <laughs> yeah, hang on, you, you haven't finished. I haven't finished. <laughs> Punc oh, I think they think it's all over. <laughs> Punctuation is not optional. It's the third dimension of language, writing. You can't tell tone, change of tone, intonation, state, unless you use punctuation. And that comma of it, you change the intonation. I, I think out of affection. You don't Thank say, you. I think out of <laughs> I'm really glad you don't speak okay, Spanish, I'm sir. Sorry <laughs> I'm, safe here. I'm sorry to be pedantic, no, but that is, uh, that is the difference between the two. I, th uh, I think given the conversation we've been having for the last 45 minutes, an apology for being pedantic possibly is not necessary. Okay. okay. <laughs> I think we're past uh, that here. And it's then the second sentence, the second sentence uh, is, I can stand a hen's egg on a table like Christopher Columbus is also ambiguous. Do you mean I can do that <laughs> like Christopher Columbus did? Which you rely, again, ambiguous, you're relying on the reader to do it. Or do you think... Uh, I can stand an egg on, uh, on its head in the same like way I, I do as a statue Columbus. of Christopher yeah. Columbus on its head. Yeah. So uh, I think you're interpreting for, that For too. that reason, I'll, uh, Sophie wins that uh, one. Uh, so I support Sophie. Uh, you just to <laughs> close observations on ambiguity, you shouldn't rely on the reader to, uh, uh, as you will, disambiguate uh, that for you. And sure. punctuation is not optional in any language at any time. I don't care. I've upset people this morning. <laughs> I upset poets and literators again. It, and, and you call it creative writing. Punctuation is for a purpose in writing because that's the only way you can tell change of tone and intonation, stress, and so on. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. <laughs> Uh, would you like to defend your, your ambi these, these appalling ambiguities you have added? I, I'm going to defend mine quickly by just saying I think with the Christopher Columbus question, uh, that's taking too logical a stance. Is he still here? Is yes. it? Oh, he sat down. It's, it's, it's yeah. Hello. Yes. TS, I think that's taking slightly too logical a stance, given that idiomatically I think it's perfectly understandable that he's not talking about standing Christopher Columbus on a table. You see what I mean? <laughs> Logically speaking, I'm sure you're right. Yeah. <laughs> there, is a, there, there is a question, there is also a question of whether there is an ambiguity in the Spanish, and I'm not going to make Valeria defend the extent to which 
one could conceivably be standing Christopher Columbus think, on a I table like the egg of a hen. All the same, I think it's playing with logic. I think it's, I think it's fine. <laughs> That's not much of a defence, is it? But I mean, I think it's clear. I think it's clear what's meant, really. If an ambiguity is um, uh, plausible, it's important to distinguish. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. yeah. It's not plausible that it's not plausible he'd be showing off about standing Christopher Columbus on a table. Though, though that would be a really cool thing as well. Sorry, there's another question over here. Yeah, sorry, sorry we, have one, we have one more question, but you don't have that much yeah. time. Uh, I can't see where the microphone is. Um, hello. Oh, uh, hi. hello. My name is Elena. I am Mexican and I'm a translator, so I work the other way around from English into Spanish, into Mexican Spanish. And I have a question for anyone, like Valeria or uh, Oli or. I forgot the name. Well, <laughs> so Sophie. Sophie. Yeah. yeah. Uh, talking about the la lengua de when you roll the tongue into a taquito, that sounds really Mexican. That That's, me. <laughs> I was thinking, um, and for Valeria, when you when you have your translation into English, do you expect the translation to sound? Uh, do you expect the character to be uh, to preserve the tradi the costumes the ordinary things that we have like in Mexico for example we it's very very common I used to play do, do my tongue less like that mm -hmm. it's the same so I, I associate I relate to that and I think uh, I was wondering if the important thing is to actually portray that Mexicanity that habits that we all used to have and therefore uh, reflect that in the translation or uh, if you expect the reader, UK or the British reader to actually understand that using a habit which children do. Yeah. Like we do that, we roll the tongue into a taquito. Yeah, I don't I know do. if that's a habit that's particularly Mexican. Yeah. I, was, I, was, I was snooker balled pieces of uh, wet paper into my face when I was at school out of taquito roll tongues, yeah. if you know what I mean. So, <laughs> I mean, um, it's not so culturally specific, this yeah. particular example. The word is, taquito is, yeah. um, but the, the action, I think, is not. Mm -hmm. And what, um, I mean, I didn't discuss their translation with them, so I can't speak about this particular exercise with, with uh, Christina, who's sitting in front of you. Um, I guess that what we had decided was, of course, he's, he's, he's not an a grounded less character. He, he is someone that comes from a very specific context and that context should not be um, wiped out completely or at all. But uh, we were also interested in creating a voice that was distinct and that could speak directly to readers in an English context. And I think one of the things that we came up with was reading uh, Flannery O'Brien um, and thinking about a kind of Irish intonation. And Irish are the Mexicans of Europe, so, so I thought we were thought that that was a perfect cultural translation. Excellent. Thank you. But I can ask you one very quick question before we finish, which is, as a, as a writer, you are, like all good writers, careful and interested in the words you choose and the voice and the rhythm and all of these things. Can you say just briefly what it feels like, what the, what the implications are for that, of the fact that we have three completely different, sort of completely the same, but also completely different openings to Story of My Teeth, which are all sort of your book, but they're not. Can you say something about what that feels like? Because they, they're not, they're, they are the same, but they're also really not the same. Is that, is that, is that like an anxiety? I mean, is, is, there, is there something stressful about being a writer going, but it's, there's only one thing which this is, and it can't be going in 12 different directions? I mean, I choose my words and my sentences very carefully, mm. but um, I don't expect them to, to, be, to, to be exact in any way once they're in translation, because I understand as a writer that that, that language is ambiguous and constructions are meant to be ambiguous and that's part of the importance of, of writing literature in particularly that things that you write can be understood in many different ways and that in themselves contain many possibilities of interpretation so I think that this is just an example of, of, of that, that fundamental I don't want to say fundamental truth, but like mm. that fundamental fact <laughs> in, in writing, which is... Um, so, so uh, yeah, this is just an example of that. 
Thank you very much. Before we finish, Sophie, um, you're just going to say a few words for us, please. As we celebrate Mexican culture and literature together this week, many of us also would like to remember the 43 students of Ayotzinapa Teaching Training College in southern Mexico. Among them were writers and linguists training to teach children who don't speak Spanish, but rather one or two of many Mexican indigenous languages. All of these students were readers and prospective teachers and the promise for education for a largely illiterate population. For what those 43 students stood for and represented for Mexico, literacy, reading and writing, we remember them. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Thank you also to our panel.